So, so far we have only talked um, about, at least quantitatively, about homogeneous equilibrium, every, everything being gases or everything being aqueous ions. But that's not even the most common thing to have happen. There are a lot of heterogeneous equilibria. We did look at the simulation of, of a solubility equilibrium, so solid, solid dissolving into ions, right? And so the question here is, if we need to define our K um, in terms of products over reactants, right? We've been using these brackets to represent molarities. You would think we would do it like that. But when you get into it, you can measure the amount of AG+. Plus. Um, we would use an instrument called the AAS. You can measure the amount of chloride. That would probably be a little more complicated, but you can do it. Um, you could weigh a mass of this, but, and that of course could give you moles. But what you can't do is find out the volume of the solid. That doesn't have any meaning, really. Um, so, now as it turns out, since you can't have a volume of a solid, at least in a chemical sense, um, there's too much empty space. If you remember from our crystal structures lab, crystals are mostly empty, so the volume of a solid is not even mostly occupied, depending on the solid. So having that actual volume of that doesn't actually help us at all. So if that's true, we can't get a molarity. And you would think this is a huge problem. Oh no, what do we do? We can't do equilibrium calculations with heterogeneous things, but not so much because as it turns out, we just ignore it. Okay, and the reason for that is the amount of solid has really no influence on um, how much, how much um, of that precipitate is gonna dissolve. The water can only fit so much ions, and so that's really a relationship between the ions and the solvent more than it is anything to do with the solid. And also, the total concentration of the solid doesn't dramatically change when you dissolve, because usually these Ks are really small. In the case of a solubility equilibrium like this, we call this a KSP. It's called a solubility product, because we're multiplying. Um, I don't know that, I, I just assume, but anyway. Um, the reason I told you guys to define it with the solid on the left and the ions on the right is because if you do that, it's a nice equation. There's not any denominator, it's just products. And of course, if we had coefficients in this, you would put them in, in the K statement as well. So now looking at that example of like the first step of the ocean equilibria, it's a reaction with water. And of course, the ocean has a whole lot of water. As it turns out, if you have pure, pure water, so in order to get that, you have to distill it 42 times in a vacuum. Good luck. Water likes to dissolve stuff, like, all the time. Um, so if we even had pure water, you can technically find the concentration of the water uh, it's 56 molar. It's the most concentrated thing in the entire world. Um, because mostly we use aqueous solutions. Um, the problem is, though, it doesn't have any meaning, right? It doesn't really mean anything. The reason the rest of it is not, you know, the reason this number is not higher is because it's empty space in between the molecules, right? And so it doesn't like mean anything. Also, there's so, so, so much water that that you can't really like increase the amount of water that's there. It's already kind of at a maximum. You could increase how much CO2 is there. That's, you know, that's what we're doing. Um, and you could, you could increase or decrease the carbonic acid that's present also, but you can't really mess with the amount of water because it's such a huge volume. So by scale, the water, the solvent, in any case, doesn't matter. So similarly, our Ks are going to be ignoring anything that is a pure liquid, so in that case, water. And so for this one, we end up with just products. Oh, oh my goodness, that's a three. Over, re over the reactants that aren't the solvent, like that. Okay, so those numbers I showed you are ignoring water because water is such a high, high concentration. That's how we treat heterogeneous equilibriums.
Now, Le Chatelier's principle does tie in with the quantitative part of equilibriums, and the way we use um, Le Chatelier's principle is going to be tied into something we call an ice box or an ice table or an ice method. ICE is the important thing. It stands for um, initial change and then equilibrium. So this is useful in a situation where you know where your, your, your conditions are at equilibrium and you want to find out what happens when we mess it up. Okay. Or it's useful in figuring out how much of any one of the components is present. Okay, so here's an example. It says we have an equilibrium reaction between an initial amount of hydrogen gas and iodine gas, which forms hydrogen iodide. Okay, so I told you already that you have to be really, really specific. You need a reaction. So we're going to cha change these words into chemical formulas. Hydrogen gas is H2. I hope you remember that it's diatomic. It's really important to know that hydrogen gas is not just H. Iodine, same thing, by the way. It's also diatomic, so it'll be I2. And then hydrogen iodide is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a very friendly molecule. I'm giving you a second to absorb that joke. It was amazing. So a couple of things that people will um, do that are a problem. They skip the states. They write a regular normal arrow. Don't do it. If it's anything to do with an equilibrium, it must be an equilibrium arrow, or I'm going to be confused why you're applying an equilibrium method. All right. Um, if there's ever a K, and it, even if it doesn't say it's an equilibrium, if there's a K value, it's an equilibrium. Okay, a big one, not a little one. So here's our reaction. Oh, the other mistake. The other mistake is not balancing the reaction, right? So we have diatomics on both sides. So this has to be two, two friendly molecules. All right. So this says initially, we know that there is one mole of hydrogen. So I'm going to put that in here. I am keeping my sig figs. And there is two moles of iodine which will form some amount of hydrogen iodide. It wants to, us to calculate the actual concentrations. So the way to approach this is we don't know how much HI there actually is. So initially, zero. We don't have a number to put there. The change that it's referring to here is when we think about Le Chatelier's principle. So we're going to apply Le Chatelier's here. We have a bunch of reactant. The reaction has to shift forward. Okay, so when we shift forward, that means we are consuming reactant. I don't know how much, some given amount. So I'm going to subtract that. I'm also subtracting it from I2. So both of the reactants are decreasing. We are going to be adding product to get to equilibrium. We have to have reactants and products present. Right now we have no product. The coefficient matters. So we're going to write 2x here. Okay. I only have one on these two. So it's just we're going to lose a certain amount of H2 and an equal amount of I2. It does not matter that these are not equal to begin with. Okay. But we're going to lose a certain amount and end up with twice as much product. So that's where the two comes from. It's not adding the x's together. There are going to be other situations where you don't have a coefficient here. That would be x or your coefficient could be three or four or whatever so you just bring the coefficient down in front of your x in other words it's still a coefficient when you put it in the change column okay so at equilibrium we just take the initial the change and that's that's what we get so we're going to go initial minus x for i2 we started out with two initially and that's going to be minus whatever we lose for hi this one's easy it's zero plus two x i'm just going to write two x all right, so the next thing we need is we need to define what K means, right? Don't skip this step. Write that down somewhere. So it's products over reactants. The reason we don't skip it is so we, we include our coefficient as an exponent. And also so we don't put the wrong concentrations in the wrong spot. I can't tell you how many times people have done that. 
So there's our definition. Now I'm going to plug in what we know, which is that KC is 50.5. And HI, we have decided, is 2x. Keep the square. You can imagine that people forget it. That's why I made just emphasized it in a weird voice. Keep it. You'll see that I have parentheses around my concentration. That's because if you don't, you're going to mess up the exponent. Let me just show you what people do. People will do this. People, not us, just, you know, like other people. That's not the same thing as what I wrote over here. You have to square the two as well. Okay, so the only way to keep people from messing that up is to use parentheses when you substitute in your, your equilibrium position. So on the bottom, we have H2, which is 1.000 minus X. And we have that multiplied by I2, which is 2.00 minus X. Those of us that love algebra might be freaking out a little bit. I know I did when I saw this in college. And I like math, but, you know, sometimes they don't show us how things actually get used in life. If, uh, if you take a second. How would you simplify this? What? It's useful. Did you know that? I didn't when I was in college. I was surprised. Um, we're going to FOIL the bottom. It's the only way to solve for x in this system of equations, right? And so, So it's gonna, I'm gonna come over here and kind of keep working. So 50.5 is equal to, I'm gonna simplify the top. Two squared is four and x squared is x squared. On the bottom, we're gonna go first, outer, inner, last. So one times two, of course we get two. And then we get minus one x. I'm dropping the sig figs because I'm not gonna have room. We'll put them back in when we're done. Okay. So, 2 minus x, because it's, it's 1 times x, right? Inner is minus x times 2, so minus another 2x. Don't forget your signs, guys. They're super important. Uh, and then negative x times negative x is x squared. What would you do next? How do you simplify further? I think probably a lot of you are going to rearrange this. So let's see if I can do that. And combine terms, right? So 2x, negative 2x, and minus x is minus 3x. And then that's a positive 2, so we'll put it at the end. Now it's in the right format that we all know and love. Um, so that's a denominator, though, still, and I don't like that. So I'm going to multiply both sides by that thing. Don't forget it's equal to something. It's not equal to zero yet. We're trying to get it there so we can solve for the x, but, you know. Distribute. Uh, what is that? 101.5? I better check. Hang on. Totally wrong, 151.5. I knew that there was a thing in there with a 0.5 or whatever. So what I did was 50.5 times three. So that's X. And then two times 50.5. Oh, that's one of them. Yeah. I've done this problem quite a few times. But, you know, it's still good to check the math. So this simplifies out so far to this. Now, um, in order to solve for x, we do have to use the quadratic equation. Um, your calculator can do that for you. If you don't already know that, search the manual of your calculator. However, I'm also going to tell you that in, that in chemistry, because of the way sig figs work, and because the k values tend to be very, very small, so in other words, the shift is small, the x will be small, we can actually make a simplifying assumption. But I am going to show you the quadratic anyway, because sometimes that assumption is, is not valid. So um, let me just copy this over. 50. 
Okay, so I've copied that over. We, in order to use the quadratic, we have to get rid of this. It has to be um, equal to zero. So our very last simplification step is just to subtract that 4x. And yeah, I just put in 50.5 minus 4x. Okay, well, maybe it's late, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so after all of that algebra, uh, which is super fun and I love it, now we're ready to use the quadratic equation. And of course, there's going to be two answers. So I'm going to show you the setup for each one. And you might want to pause it and check your work. Usually in class, I would make you all do this um, just to remind ourselves of what we know. But so, you know, here's A, here's B. It's negative. Don't forget it. Uh, and then there's C. So I'm going to pause this and show you how it should be set up. You should try to solve it yourself first and see if you get the same answer. Okay, so these are the two possible answers. Now, here's the fun part. In chemistry, uh, only one of these is going to make sense. So we wanted to know the concentrations of each thing. Our possible answers are 2.32 for value of x or 0.94. So I'm going to go back to this table. If it were 2.32, we would get a negative amount of hydrogen and a negative amount of iodine. Now, clearly that doesn't make any sense, right? So, so I'm talking about is if you go minus 2.32 from one, you're going to get negative 1.32, right? So that can't work. That's not a possible answer in reality, right? Even though the quadratic equation gave us that answer. So we're going to have to assume that it's actually 0.94, which means that I can figure out how much H2 I have, I can figure out how much I2 I have, and I certainly can figure out how much HI we ended up with. So you always want to go back to your ice table, to your equilibrium position, and you want to make sure to do that last final calculation. Don't, don't, don't get stuck in a trap that like, oh, I solved for X, so I'm done with this problem. <laughs> okay, because the question was actually asking us to calculate the concentrations of the um, things that are in the reaction at equilibrium. So, and remember these are moles, but we're assuming one liter um, of solution. So you could also say molarity. Well, it's not a solution, it's gas, but you know, one liter container. So the final answers are going to be 1.88 molar of HI, 1.06 molar I2, and 0.9, or sorry, 0 0.06 molar H2. So that's how you're going to use ice tables um, to calculate the amount of stuff at equilibrium. Here is what we just did in kind of like a step-by-step -step instruction format. This is helpful for people um, when doing homework. Now, we don't always have to use the quadratic. So I said, often we can utilize the fact that the Ks are very small. And that means the amount of product form is going to be relatively small as well. So we have a simplification that we can do. The start of the problem is still the same. So as it turns out, this is acetic acid. We use this in lab a lot, or sometimes the conjugate, which is acetate. Um, Acetic acid, when you place it in water, it is what we call a weak acid. By the way, it is expected that you know the strong acids kind of like by heart. There's seven of them. They're listed in table 4.2 of chapter four. So you might want to go back and make some flashcards of that. Strong base is also a good idea to know. Okay. Those are going to come in handy in this chapter, um, actually this module, all three chapters. So when you have a weak acid or a weak base, it means that it's in equilibrium. So the equation we would write would be starting with the acid. This is the acidic hydrogen in acetic acid. Remember from Chem 1, we can also write it like this. This means the same thing. This H is the one that's actually attached to the oxygen. The ones attached to carbon are never acidic enough. They're not going to be given away. So what we end up with is the hydrogen can leave. That's what makes it an acid. 
and the rest of it stays. That's the conjugate, which is called acetate. Okay. So um, just some names for you here, right? What makes it weak is that it's an equilibrium. So we have acetic acid and the products of the ionization all present in the container all at once. So we need to know how much H plus there is. By the way, we're going to learn in the next chapter. These all go really, really are integral to each other. But as it turns out, hydronium ion and hydrogen ion are the same thing. The difference is that you know, you're adding water, you're not. Acids are defined as aqueous, so water is always present, and so we often treat these two as interchangeable. I'll show you more about that in future videos. At any rate, so we need to figure out how much H plus is there. Our initial concentration is provided here, and I know that's the initial, initial because it's in terms of just the acetic acid, like it doesn't say H plus or acetate. So initially we will assume that none of the hydrogen or the acetate is there, which means the reaction has to shift forward once we put it in water. So we're going to lose some reactant and we're going to gain product. Now this is a case where the X's are not going to add up. Don't get stuck thinking about it like an, like an algebra equation, right? Just because we give up one X doesn't mean we only get one X on the other side. The reason that's true is because this is, essentially one particle breaking up, right? And so if we have one of these, you're going to get one hydrogen and one acetate, okay? So remember that the only thing that matters here is the coefficients, and these are all ones, and the sign, whether it's plus or minus. Zero plus x is x, and here's x. So our k is going to be products over reactants. This is not the solvent, okay? So this is, we can, we're not going to ignore that. The solvent is water. And so we're going to substitute everything in where we have the KC here. This is actually from the back of our textbook. We're going to learn that um, there's an appendix that lists all of these for the weak acids and bases. Um, so my X, uh, my X, my Acetate is X and my H plus is X. So we end up with X times X. No exponents on that one. And then this is 0 0.20 minus X. Now, so far, that is exactly what we did in the last problem. Different numbers, different coefficients, but essentially the same problem. Here's where the simplifying assumption happens. We said the value of K is very small which means it's mostly reactant, not very much product. Which means when we take 0 0.20, which is only two sig figs, and subtract this small amount that is formed, it's still going to be basically 0 0.20. We call this the simplifying assumption. What it means is we can ignore the stuff in the bottom. We just know, ignore the x in the bottom. Okay, so now our equation becomes 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 on the left equals x squared over 0 0.20. It means we don't need to use the quadratic equation, right? Um, all we have to do is take 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 times 0.2. And I remember that when we talked about exponents in terms of scientific notation in the last module, I told you that it's really important to use the EXP or EE or 10 carat button on your calculator. So remember that. And if you need to look up the instructions, you, you can always you can always use the manual for your calculator. So what we get from this is 3.6 times 10 to the negative 6. That's a 6 equals x squared. So then of course to, to get rid of a square, I just, you know, square root both sides. I'm keeping all of the sig figs in my calculator, and I don't round until the end. I have two significant digits, though, from our starting, so I'm going to go, go ahead and round to two digits. My calculator says 0 0.00189736666. 
I'm going to round to two, so we're going to go point zero zero, not significant. Those are placeholders. One nine molarity, or you could write it as one point nine times ten to the negative three. Both of those are fine. Um, so that is clearly far faster than what we did last time. We can check our work. The rule of thumb is that if your answer for X is within 10% uh, or less of point of the initial amount, then your assumption is fine. So X is less than 10% of that. Whoops, that. And then we're okay. So you can just do a quick check at the end, right? So 0 0.20 times 10% is a very small number, 0 0.02. But, which is the same as saying 10 to the negative 2, that is still far bigger than our x value, all right? So the other way to look at this is, um, you know, just kind of thinking about can we make the assumption? When can we make the assumption? If um, I just take that 0.2 and actually subtract out the 0 0.0019, right? Our calculators are going to tell us that it is 0. Oh my gosh, go. 0.1981. That's what it says. But when we think about our significant digits being two, we have to round at this position. So we're right back to the same place. That's why the simplifying assumption is a safe bet. When k is small, it means the x's will be small. We can just ignore the x in the denominator, or x's if there's multiple. Cool trick, right?